Hey, Lions. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are you? Oh, good. Get my <clears throat> oh, my cameras. Almost up. You got over COVID and all. Yeah, I got over COVID. <clears throat> I seem to have found a cold, but other than that, I'm doing fine. Yep. Um, a lot going around. Yeah, there is. Um, we were, Amy and I were just talking a little bit this morning that, um, you know, maybe we take public comment first. We just sort of, you know, adds a little something I wanted to say in the beginning, but then we could take public comment um, and then have the committee discuss after we take public comment. Just let members of the public, um, you know, have their say. We'll see if we get, we have one already. That's okay. fine. Yeah. And then, so that's the only structure I was thinking of, really. Yeah. Um, and I'm ready to share anything that needs to be shared. I've got the um, the red line version, and I've got all the comments and stuff too. So. Yep. You sent me a note. Why aren't these in the right order? So weird. Um, you sent me a note saying that uh, here's a statement you need to read at the beginning of the meeting. Yes. Yeah, that's just the statement about having the meeting virtual. Oh, here it is. I got it. Okay. Yes. Are we ready? No, it's not um, 8 o'clock. No, yet. it's not 8. And it's not 8 o'clock yet. We don't have all of our members. Morning, Amy. Morning. Jack. Jason. Hey. Can't see who else is here. Hey, Beth, just like structurally to avoid having all of our chat at the beginning of the meeting recording. Do you want to stop the recording now and then right before we call to order, start it again? Then. Yeah, I think most of the members are here. I see Anna and Brian, Jack Lyons. Good morning, everyone. Let's see, I guess Linda and Dave are missing at the moment. Oh, and John Tobiason, who just emailed me. And and what about Christy and Franny? And Chris. We have a large group. Do we need quorum today or anything? Um, I think it'd be, it, yeah, it'd be good to have quorum to vote on the paper, on approving the paper. And let me just see what John just said. Well, I gotta send him the link. Where's Chris? What is the quorum anyway, the number for us? Um, we have seven members. Oh, okay, so we're so, good. Yeah. All right, so we're good to go. Yeah, we just need What four. did John say? Um, I'm searching for the email with the Zoom link. So I'm just gonna send him the agenda link. I don't, I can't send him his panelist link and then I can just let him in. All right, I'm gonna get started. I have until nine o'clock. I'm happy to facilitate the meeting uh, until a couple of minutes before nine, and then I need to duck out and join a whole new, <clears throat> join a whole new group at nine o'clock. Another subject. So pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and extended by chapters 22 and 107 of the acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted by remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means the ones we are now using. 
Good morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. So we're going to take comments from the public first and then uh, and address those. Uh, and then the committee will um, discuss the paper and the comments and we'll go from there. Can I just uh, say before we take public comment, I just want to thank all the groups that did submit comments. Um, you know, we took comments from a number of staff and some and boards and committees, and I just want to thank them um, and and say that you know their work definitely made the the paper a better paper. Um, a lot of people had input and uh, put a lot of work into it. So excellent. Yeah. Great. Good morning, John. So your sounds not now. working, John. If we're going to start with um, comments from the public, does that mean that if folks from the public want to be heard, they can raise their hand and we can unmute them, and then that's kind of how the process will go? That's fine. I can't see any of them, so that will be up to Beth. All right, so we do have some. We have a raised hand. Um, Jeremy, I'm going to give you. Uh, You're unmuted. Yeah, hi, good morning. Morning. Good morning. I was trying to see if you can hear me or not. Yep. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, yeah, I, so I live at 34 High Point Drive in Amherst um, on a private well. And one thing that I am very concerned about is uh, contamination from any potential developments. So I was wondering um, what the current recommendation that you have is for setbacks from private wells and um I you know I think yeah I just so I'm, I'm interested in what your thoughts are at the moment all right so um Jack do you want to answer that yeah correct me if I'm wrong but uh for the solar panels I believe we adopted what is suitable for a, a septic system or an underground storage tank on the property and that would be 100 feet and for a battery facility we extended it i think we doubled uh the distance to 200 feet so that you know adequate uh, protections to you know from known contaminant sources like a septic system and tank seemed more pro seemed appropriate <clears throat> for a solar uh panel installation which which does not have uh is not a source of contamination and then you know battery is a, a separate argument there but again that's why we increased the distance uh, to 200 versus 100. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know how this works. So can I keep, I can respond? Please. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> and what about for public wells? Uh, public wells have a 400 <clears throat> foot, uh, nothing happens radius um, in the zone one. Um, and so there's nothing allowed within 400 feet of a, of a public well. After that, you're either in a zone two or, or not. Um, and we didn't have any additional recommendations for that. Well, I guess, yeah. um, I mean, oh. just thinking on a like precautionary approach, shouldn't private wells be given the same protection as 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 the public well? It seems like, I mean, yeah, the solar panels themselves don't seem like a contaminant, but any type of flame retardants that are used on them or cleaning chemicals, I don't know what is used, but I just feel like having the same protections for private and public wells seems like a, a, a you know, the, it, coming it's not outside. done for, it's not done for, known contaminant sources other than uh, the zone one for uh, public wells and 100 feet for private wells. Amy? I, I mean, I'll just clarify a little bit, Jeremy, that 
kind of how the hydrology works of these wells is the more you pump out of the ground, the bigger the zone of influence is around a well. And it's why a private well that's only pumping a much smaller volume, it's why the zone of influence, the, the area in which something that falls on the ground may impact the well is much smaller than for a public well where we're pumping a million gallons a day out of the ground. And so that's why those zones are different sized for different situations. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that I, I understand that. And that does, I mean, I get it from a, you know, a purely, you know, gallons of water that are being moved through the, through the system. But it just seems like on a private well, you know, where I'm responsible for all the costs, if there's going to be a solar development in our neighborhood, which, you know, is one of the areas that are being proposed, then I'm going to have to pay for testing or is the town going to pay for testing? If there's contamination, am I going to pay to put a whole house filtration system? Is the town going to bring public water? I just feel like having the same protections for private and public seems like a, a very, you know, a very cautionary approach to, to this solar development. If there's a release of some kind at a development of any kind, solar or otherwise, um, then the, the owner of that development where the release occurred is responsible for testing and cleanup on your property. And so then, I mean, those are, those are property line blind. So being that PFAFs are what are, you know, are in the news frequently for groundwater contamination, and what happens if the wells get contaminated in a neighborhood like High Point or Flat Hills? And then, then what happens? There isn't a known PFAS source in solar developments that we it's have. Flame we, we have researched it and we haven't found such a link. Yeah, um, Jeremy, we, we specified that there, there would be no PFAS within, you know, any sort of uh, fire suppression activities. Okay. Um, that's what we've recommended. And also in the panel construction that the panels themselves the are PFAS free. Yeah, would be PFAS free. Okay, so I mean, I just, I would just like it to be, you know, my, my point is, I just think private and public wells should have similar protections. And I think you can okay. leave it at that. Yep. Thank you for your comment. Beth, do we have other comments? Yep. Eric, Eric Backrack, I'm just allowed you to talk. <clears throat> thank you so much. And good morning to you all. And I want to thank you for your um, your deep commitment uh, to uh, preserving uh, our great water in Amherst. Um, I'm not a hydrologist. Um, I'm not even an, uh, a, a, a lay hydrologist, but I'm a voracious reader. And I wanted to kind of ask, um, generally speaking, what has changed in the water protection uh, policy in Amherst? One of the first sources that I went to in Googling watershed protection um, is derived from the Trust for Public Land in a 55 page document entitled Land Conservation and the Future of America's Drinking Water. One a small excerpt from this document is in the executive summary section says, watershed protection is the first and most fundamental step in a multi-barrier approach to protecting drinking water. Healthy, functioning watersheds naturally filter pollutants and moderate water uh, quantity by slowing surface runoff and increasing infiltration of water into the soil. The result is less flooding and soil erosion, cleaner water downstream and greater groundwater reserves. And I'm not purporting to be didactic here or instructive, I'm just wondering what has changed. The second document I'm going to uh, quote from is the watershed protection policy uh, developed on that is uh, um, by the town of Amherst and is cited on the uh, watershed protection homepage. And it says management philosophy approaches. Even with a large amount of preserved land surrounding Amherst surface water supplies, minimal changes 
in the land use, impervious surface coverage, and forested land within a watershed can greatly alter water quality. Scattered development and frontage lot construction threaten Amherst drinking water. The Conservation Commission, aware of the need to protect the town's water supplies, actively supports appropriate measures that will preserve both underground aquifers and their recharge areas and above ground reservoirs. What, what, um, what inspired me to do a lot of the research was uh, initially a comment by uh, uh, a, um, a freshwater ecologist at this meeting, but it was in January, who cited a compact that was reportedly to be reached between the town of Amherst and the town of Shutesbury, um, in which uh, um, many uh, uh, pieces of the watershed that, um, that supply the Nurse and Dean Brooks and flowing that, that flow into um, the Atkins Reservoir were supposed to have been protected. And I'm just wondering if you could just tell me what has changed in the last 17 years, and certainly not, not nothing that has changed since you've published the, um, the citation uh, that I um, um, mentioned from the watershed protection policy of the town itself. Um, I will start by saying that one thing that's changed in 17 years is that the town has acquired large tracts of land within the watershed. I would defer to Dave Zomack's memory as to uh, how much that might be, uh, but both as a member of town meeting and, and this body, uh, I recall numerous acquisitions of land within the watershed. Um, so the, the town and the various bodies within the town represented here uh, have been working quite hard uh, for as long as I've been in town. Uh, to increase the watershed protection by acquiring lands. Dave, do you have any idea roughly how much land has been acquired in the last 17 years? Yeah, I, I, I honestly don't know the number of acres, but yeah, I would just concur. And, you know, Beth and, and Amy can jump in anytime, but, you know, we, over the last 20 or so years that I've been with the town, you know, Lyons is right that we have strategically um, picked up, acquired, and preserved a number of parcels um, in in the various watersheds that we draw from, and we continue to do that. Um, you know, we're we're in direct contact with landowners, you know, like Coles and other landowners that own land in our watersheds that we think are are high priority for protection. So that that work is ongoing. You know, there are DEP grants that we've acquired, um, applied for and and received over the years to help pay for that. And the town has put in money uh, for things like appraisals and other other studies to kind of document which which parcels are the most uh, important. So we're I, I would say we're not done with that effort, and it's it's ongoing. We're always on the lookout for those parcels that might be important to protect uh, the, the, the water quality in wells, in our wells, as well as our reservoirs in Pelham and, and Shutesbury. But happy to defer to Amy or Beth if they have anything to add. Yeah, I can just add that I'd say, I don't know, is it five years ago that we purchased Romer Woods, which was over, over 100 acres. That was a very large purchase in Pelham and a, a wonderful acquisition for the town. Can I ask a further question? Just in response to your responses to my question? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my, my concern, of course, is the um, three parcels that are were um, pr proposed for development upstream from the Atkins Reservoir, through which the Dean and Nurse Brooks flow, the, the uh, solar projects, Pratt Corner, East, West, and South. And why those, those are the watersheds that were cited in 2005 to be protected. Um, and was, uh, was uh, the compact was suggested to be re reached um, 
by the Hampshire regional uh, governments. Why they weren't, why we, we, they were never ever, um, the, uh, the protection of those watersheds just um, went by the wayside. And um, secondly, um, the watersheds that I'm specifically referring to, and I'm sure that the town has sedulously looked at acquiring um, watershed, other watershed areas, but the watershed areas that I'm specifically referring to are ones that are, uh, don't seem to be protected yet. Well, um, I, I don't know if you were at the meeting where we, we did show some maps showing um, all the Coles lands. Yeah, the parcels I'm, that you're talking back are, are owned by Coles and um, they're within an area that Coles just put a huge conservation restriction on. They, um, and, and not to say that this, does anything for the particular little, the parcels that you're talking about, the areas that they almost excluded from their conservation restriction, but they put a conservation restriction on over 2000 um, acres, mostly in Shutesbury, mostly in the Atkins Reservoir watershed. And all of that land um, can never be developed. It can still be forested by coals. Um, but that whole 2,000 acres can never uh, be developed. And they sort of specifically excluded these little areas that they may potentially be looking at for solar. And if I could just follow up just one uh, qu um, question uh, um, um, that was triggered by the previous um, uh, commenters, uh, Jeremy Anderson, I think his name was, question and concern. Um, the, uh, uh, based on the draft white paper, an estimate of almost four and a half percent of the households in Amherst are uh, derive their water from um, private wells. And most of those, uh, those households are in North Amherst. I understand that there is a proposed setback for a, a house um, uh, um, from, um, fr from any kind of development um, but what happens to the, it's, if four and a half percent of the town's households derive water from uh, well water and, and they're primarily in the same area, we're not talking about a single house, we're talking about several neighborhoods, hundreds and hundreds of homes. Is that a condition that might be um, different from a single house deriving its water? From a um, from a well. Jack or Lions or anyone want to respond to that? In terms of setbacks, I don't see that it's any any different. Uh, a private well is a private well, um, and I understand your concern. but it's not entirely within or at all within the town's ability to tell people what they can and can't do with their property outside of providing zoning and guidance in the form of what we're trying to do here to lay out some guidelines that, um, tell people how they need to design their solar projects so that they um, have as little impact as possible. And that's what we're trying to do. If, if several neighbors- Amy, hold on, yes. please, Amy. I, I more just kind of want to be clear as we're talking about private wells, which certainly are important to talk about, but to be clear, the jurisdiction of the Water Supply Protection Committee is for public water sources and not private wells. And we did, and we, we tried to explain this in the paper as well. We do talk a little bit about private wells, but we're very clear that we that's that's not our charge. That's not the charge of the public work. So even Jason and Beth and myself sitting here as people from public works, um, private wells aren't under our jurisdiction. So we're offering our 
um, recommendations that can be taken or not be taken by the solar bylaw working group um, about private wells. And we encouraged the board of health who do yes. have the jurisdiction over mm -hmm. private wells yes. to input their guidance because th that is their jurisdiction on that. So I just wanna be clear as we're talking about some of this yeah. stuff that we're acknowledging that that's outside of the scope yes. or our expertise when it comes to private private wells and, and different assets of that. Yeah, I, I, I definitely understood that as of the, the January meeting because it was, I raised not a, the same question, but a similar question. And I was uh, uh, um, told that it was the Board of Health that is responsible for the regulation and protection of private drinking water. And I, I had assumed that because um, nobody on the Board of Health is, rep is represented on the Solar Bylaw Working Group, that that kind of protection and the regulation of drinking water overall was ceded from the board to the, to, to the Water Supply Protection Committee from the Board of Health by the Board of Health. The board of Health. So I'm concerned that we're kind of in a catch-22 uh, uh, position here. Um, that is, um, frankly, well, as I need to correct you because nothing was ceded to anyone um, from the Board of Health to this committee. Yeah. Okay. Well, whatever it's happened, not a I, valid I, statement. I okay. That I I would then I would retract that the invalid statement, but I would say that as a, as, a, um, as a private well owner, I'm concerned that, um, uh, that I'm not sure who then is looking after the, uh, the protection of dry, private drinking water, well-based water in Amherst. That's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other? Public comments, Beth? Uh, but, but, no, no one else has raised their hand at the moment um, to talk. Uh, well, Jeremy, did, let me ask. Let me unmute Jeremy. Um, yes, sorry, real, real quick. I just okay. wanted to follow up uh, with Amy and, and what Eric were saying. And, and just, I, I, I think if, if these are recommendations coming from a, a precautionary angle, and even even if it's outside of the jurisdiction of, of this this group, um, I think having a recommendation saying, you know, as the same protections would be, you know, would make me a lot more comfortable as a homeowner with a private well. And I just appreciate your your time and effort. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Yeah, we have no more um, raised hands at the moment. Okay. We have comments from panelists. I won't discriminate. Brian. Sure. I, I think I just wanted to speak a, a little bit to the rationale and sort of considerations that, that went into it from the stamp from our standpoint when we were working on it. There were a few consider I mean, there were many considerations that, that informed us. Um, but one that um, is important. Well, two, I think that are important to, to, to raise. One is that there already exist solar panels all across the town watershed and across um, areas with private wells. Most of them are on people's roofs, but the fundamental chemistry that affects runoff from the solar panels to the ground and then from them doesn't change whether it's a ground mount or roof mount system. And we just didn't see any major risks. We looked to a variety of sources, um, including large private bottled water companies who have decided that they wanted to go green and installed solar panels. Many of these large private water companies, including Nestle or Poland Springs owned by Nestle, have installed huge arrays in direct proximity to their number one capital asset, their private groundwater supply. Um, and with the extensive funds available to them by a huge multinational corporation, they didn't find any risk. And so um, that was one of many things that informed us. The second thing is that the, the current state of, of energy supply in our area 
is liquid hydrocarbons sprinkled across both the public water supply and around people's private wells. Um, at least one member of this committee working in, in as a private contractor has responded to um, number two fuel oil spills in direct proximity to other people's wells and Atkins Reservoir. And so in sort of the larger picture is that the current state of things involves considerable risk. We know that fuel oil and other hydrocarbons are incredibly cancerous, incredibly dangerous, um, and we don't have um, fail-proof solutions to those. Um, and so some of, one of the larger picture concerns was that um, there, no energy supply is without risk, um, but the current state of things in, involves substantial risks. Um, and so um, any move away from, from using hydrocarbons um, and, and spreading them all across our watersheds, in our opinion, is, a, is something that we should be not, not, we shouldn't be putting up barriers to that. Other comments? Anna? Um, uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone who put in so much work here. I've got a couple of little uh, 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 things that I will I will send along. I have two questions that I want to uh, thank you guys for uh, putting in the uh, much more uh, language in this around the battery uh, sweat, because that was something that I hadn't been thinking about before. And I have just a quick question about the front front page, and I'm just curious. Um, our Amherst policies include a near net zero requirement. I thought it was like just a net zero requirement. So why, why did the near net zero requirement get, get in there? I'm just on the very, it's like the second sentence. Yeah, I think that is, um... From a document and I can I can verify that I can verify if it should be near net zero or if it should be exactly net zero and that that came from one of one of the climate action documents I'm not sure but I will I will figure that out thank you sure Sorry, other questions, comments? Okay, seeing none. Um, we wanna see if the committee wants hand. to make a recommendation on- <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna make a recommendation that we, go ahead, Brian. I see a raised hand from Michael D. Chiara. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, uh, Michael. Thanks, Beth. Thank you, Beth. Um, so I'm Michael D. Chiara. I live in Shutesbury, actually. I'm on the planning board and I'm the chair of the ECAC for Shutesbury. And I just wanted to quickly respond to what Brian had said because um, the Shutesbury planning board has just updated our solar bylaw for the fourth time. Um, and the primary issue is in terms of risk to water as we see it is batteries, it's not panels. Um, and that panels, it's it's pretty well documented that lithium ion batteries, which is the technology used now, has the ability to catch fire um, and it cannot be put out by water. Um, so, and the chemicals that are released in combustion from lithium ion batteries, even though it's doused in water will then going to the ground. So I think just to sort of refocus, the, I think the concern on contamination of groundwater is less about runoff from panels and more about the possibility, if not likelihood, that at some point some of these batteries might catch fire. And the reason that's important is that every large scale solar project in Massachusetts that's gonna get state subsidies through the SMART program has been required for the last year and a half to have on-site lithium ion batteries or battery storage, um, which at this point de facto is lithium ion batteries. So um, I think that's really the issue that the state's requiring the bundling of solar and batteries and the batteries have a risk um, for combustion. Combustion then in the containment of heat and fire process 
creates runoff into the ground. So thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, um, I'm sure uh, Jack might want to respond too, but yeah. we we certainly we we've we've delved pretty deep into the battery yeah. battery um, topic, and we've added more since we've gotten comments yeah. from Amherst Fire Department and other. So, um, but yeah, no, that's absolutely that's where the concern is. Um, Jack, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I think you 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 hit the nail on the head. We have covered everything I think that you spoke of, uh, Mike, within uh, the recommendations provided within the white paper. Yeah. So appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think Jeremy might want to talk again. I'm sorry to comment again. Um, <laughs> Okay, I, I can't tell if your hand just gets left up or if you actually no, I, want to say I, something. I'm sorry. You'd think by now I'd understand how to use Zoom, but I'm um, still working at it. Uh, I, I definitely want to just echo what Michael's saying and, and you know, just keep the focus on the, the chemicals that are used as flame retardants, um, because I, I just picture fires in large solar fields as some as as an inevitable, not as a, you know, it might happen. Um, and just that that seems to me the biggest risk for contamination of, of drinking water. And then just to to follow up on Brian's comment, I I just Googled, um, you know, and always a good statement to start with, but Consumer Reports has an, a recent article from 2020 saying what's in your bottled water. And companies like Nestle have PFAS, have heavy metals in their drinking water. So I think just saying that, oh, well, Nestle is doing this doesn't mean it's the right thing to be doing. And we should be protecting our water as, you know, as, as much as possible. It's It's so... It's just like a, such a fundamental thing is protect our water. Absolutely, which yeah. is what we're trying to do. We're all in agreement about that. Um, I believe I saw or heard, I guess it was saw a comment from the uh, Amherst fire chief saying that if there was a fire at a battery facility in Amherst that there uh, number one strategy would be to let it burn and not try to put it out that it's just too hot and too dangerous and their their goal would be to protect a you know anything that's nearby um, but not to try to put the actual battery fire out it would just let it burn There's a couple of panelists with, with their hands up. I'm on the wrong list again. <laughs> Dave, did you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah, thanks Lyons. No, no, I just wanted to kind of put a, put a, you know, highlight the, this last part of this conversation. I'm coming off uh, last night's conservation commission meeting um, which uh, went pretty long and had a very robust discussion of of the town's first 100% um, battery storage project, which is currently going through the permitting process on Sunderland Road. Um, out, uh, this is the former site of Annie's Garden Store, just south of Bub's Barbecue, um, and. Most of the discussion, you know, uh, and I was reminded from last evening that most of the discussion was about containment. What are the containment systems? And again, you know, um, as as the gentleman from Shutesbury referenced, I think, you know, all new and proposed projects, solar projects will have battery storage. But this one, in fact, is our first complete battery storage. There are no panels there. It's all about battery storage. And the Conservation Commission is is grappling with what what jurisdiction do they have, what authority do they have to uh, require containment in the event of a, a fire. So uh, it's not clear. This is kind of new ground for Amherst, and I think the Zoning Board of Appeals will be uh, having similar discussions. So I think I'm glad I have not reviewed the latest draft of your paper, but I'm glad uh, that there is, you know, uh, more emphasis on on battery and battery storage and 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 those parts of uh, solar projects. So thanks, 
Zach? Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, with, within our treatment of the topic of the battery uh, energy systems, that, um, you know, we cited what went wrong, uh, like historically, uh, and there, there, there were some catastrophic, uh, you know, burns at, at battery uh, storage facilities in the past. Uh, the technology and, and and the National Fire Protection uh, uh, Association is on top of this. But what has happened, it has evolved. The technology has evolved in terms of sensing where there might be a thermal runaway. And there's, you know, many sensors that are now equipped within these battery energy uh, storage devices. So, you know, they're sensing uh, heat and they, they are, there's a power down that's kind of hardwired in there. And it's just a total different situation than, you know, the nightmare situations that, that you know, we all have read of where these things go on fire. So the, the probability of a fire at these things are, is much reduced than uh, it was say, you know, 10 years ago. I just want to make that point. Yeah, and I mean, I'm just looking at that section of the paper, you know, we, we list what, what can, what the fire department, but also the National Fire Protection are recommending, um, detection, notification, suppression systems, adequate, adequate spacing between the um, batteries themselves, certainly containment. Um, you know, that's all sort of the most up-to-date recommendations from these groups as to how to, to deal with, with the situation. And it's changing all the time, really. I don't see. All right, so I will make a recommendation that we accept the white paper with um, the one potential clarification of the word nearly on the first page after Beth uh, researches where that came from. Um, any discussion on that, Jack? So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? And I'll that's unanimous. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. All right. Um, um, don't that's... believe we have any other business this morning. No, this was just a special meeting just for this white paper. You know, our next meeting will be in January and maybe we can actually do it in person. That's what I'm kind of hoping actually. Um, I forget the date, but I, I think I sent you guys, a, if I didn't send you a calendar invite, I will for the for the January meeting. Um, and and yeah, so this, so this paper now will be finalized as is and forwarded on to the, um, Solar Bylaw Working Group for them. Um, and then it's also, it exists also for Shrewsbury and Pelham um, planning boards or, or Amherst, you know, planning board, zoning, CONCOM, whoever are interested in opinions about solar in terms of drinking water. Um, I kind of foresee Shrewsbury and Pelham if if these projects come forward to them and they're in, a, in some kind of a land use review process their boards are that they'll look to Amherst for just our opinion on, you know, our watershed lands. Um, so that's where I see it going. And great, good, great job, the subcommittee. Good job. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Appreciate Have a good day. You all your hard work. See you in January. John has a stand up. Oh, gosh. John Tobias and John. There you go. There we go. Technology. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Hey, I just want to say thank you to everybody who worked on this so hard. And I'll just apologize for being less engaged in this issue as I than I have in others. Uh, just the way life has gone. So uh, thank you. And this is uh, from Idaho right at the moment. So thank you very much. Okay. Idaho. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you all. all right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank Good night.